Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about uterine myomas, which are the most frequently occurring tumor of the female genital tract. A myoma is a benign tumor, which is formed by the smooth musculature of the uterus. That's also where it gets its name from, myometrium myoma. These benign tumors are hormone sensitive, which means that estrogen accelerates their growth and gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists decelerate their growth. Myomas also are considered to have monoclonal growth, which means that they cause an upregulation of the hormone receptors for estrogen and progesterone. So they basically create a positive feedback loop for themselves. So a little increase in estrogen can cause an even faster growth. Uterine myomas are also called fibroma or lyomyoma. A differentiation between the terms can be made by the content of muscular tissue or connective tissue within the benign tumor. A myoma contains almost exclusively smooth muscular tissue, while a fibroma consists of large amounts of connective tissue. The diagnosis, clinical presentation and treatment is the same for the different types as this is a histologic differentiation. Uterine myomas occur very frequently. It is estimated that around 20 to 30 percent of women over the age of 30 have one or several of them. If a uterus has several tumors, the myometrium will be visualized under a sonographic examination as dilated veins, arterioles and venules, as well as the visible concentric hypoechoic and heterogeneous tumors. In some cases, it is possible to see a central necrosis and calcification under the ultrasound. The uterine myomas are the most common tumor of the female genital tract, but luckily they are benign. There are a few predisposing factors for their development, which are nulliparity, so in women that have never been pregnant before, then the age of 25 to 45 years, so until around before the onset of menopause, and also women who had an early onset of their first menstruation, so when the menarche, so the first menstruation, occurred before the woman was 10 years old. Also obesity, usage of oral contraceptives, and a family history of myomas are predisposing factors. We can classify myomas according to which part of the uterus they occupy or according to which part of the wall of the uterus they occupy, regardless of where in the uterus they are found. According to the classification of where in the uterus the myoma lies, we differentiate the corpus myoma, which is in the body of the uterus, or cervical myomas, which lie in or close to the cervix of the uterus. According to the classification of which part of the wall of the uterus the myoma occupies, we differentiate into inframural myoma, so embedded into the myometrium, subserosal myoma, which means it lies directly under the perimetrium, submucous myoma, so just beneath the endometrium, intraligamental myomas, so the myoma lies within a ligament, and pedunculated myomas, so that they basically hang off the uterus, either on the inside or the outside. The most often occurring form is the intramural myoma. There is a special term for uterus that has many myomas. We call that 
uterus myomatosis. In this case, the uterus can be very enlarged and can present with several in and out bulgings under sonography. In an histologic examination, we can determine the degree of connective tissue that is present in the myoma. In case of a high content of connective tissue, we call it a fibrolyomyoma or fibroma. Now I would like to talk about the clinical presentation. If a myoma is small in size, it is usually asymptomatic. Depending on the number of myomas, the size and their location, it can lead to disorders in menstruation, as the blood flow might be increased or obstructed, and also disorders in micturition and defecation are possible, as the myoma might compress structures of the urogenital or gastrointestinal tract. Due to changes in menstruation, it is also possible for an iron deficiency anemia to occur. So we should check the iron levels in an affected patient regularly. Also back pain, dyspareunia, so pain during intercourse, and a predisposition to develop urinary tract infections is possible. In case of a pedunculated myoma, it is possible for the myoma to twist around the stalk and an infarction of the myoma might occur. In case of several myomas, a patient might experience infertility or it might be difficult to carry a pregnancy to term. In very rare cases, it has been seen that a myoma can develop into a malignant Lyomyosarcoma. A diagnosis is usually done by transvaginal and or transabdominal sonography, the findings of which I have already mentioned earlier. So to recap the sonography, we can usually see an increase in vessel size and diameter and also the vessel number because the myoma has to be supplied with blood and also we can visualize the actual myoma, in some cases with central necrosis and calcification. Also, an uneven surface of the uterus can be seen, and depending on the size of the myoma or myomas, the uterus might be enlarged. In the next point, I would like to talk about the treatment. The treatment can be either by medication or surgery, depending on the symptoms of the patient and the size, localization and number of the myomas. In a symptomatic patient, our goal is to relieve the symptoms. In asymptomatic cases, the treatment is usually not necessary, but we should check on the development of the myomas around every 6 to 12 months to see a potential growth. The hormone therapy consists of gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists as loiprolite, glycerolin or nafarilin as they can stop or slow down the growth of the myomas and also decrease their vascularization. These medications should however not be used long term as they have a lot of side effects as osteoporosis and possibly depression. GnRH analogues are usually given before a surgery or for up to six months. Some patients are given oral contraceptives as an add-on to the GnRH therapy as it can control the amount of bleeding and pain, but it has to be kept in mind that they induce a more rapid growth of the myoma as they contain estrogen as well as progesterone. The same goes for progestin-releasing intrauterine devices, or short IUDs, another form of contraception, as they as well control the bleeding, but also those increase the growth rate of the myoma. Other medications that can be used include androgenic agonists, as danazol, as those suppress the growth of the myoma. But those also have many side effects as acne, edema and hair loss. In the surgical therapy, 
the myoma can be removed if the axis allows it. This is called a myomectomy, which is the excision of the subserosal or intramural myoma. This treatment does not interfere with the possibility for further pregnancies. It is also possible to perform an embolization of the myoma, or better its vascularization, to prevent a further growth. In this surgery, polyvinyl alcohol is injected into the arteries that supply blood to the myoma, causing it to reduce in size. In women who have fulfilled their wish for having more children or in very severe cases, the patient can consider a hysterectomy as a surgical treatment. This is the only definitive treatment, but it comes along with definitive infertility so it has to be carefully considered in women of fertile age. That's all for this video. I hope it was helpful. And if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much.